after show on the Sports Out Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soups. Time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe. Please re-interview the program. I'm your host, Wim Lou, joined once again by producer co-host Amit Mon. Uh, we are going to talk about the Raptors' latest loss to the Detroit Pistons. Afterwards, we will call Garrett Temple on the hey. line. It'll be interesting to talk to Garrett. Friend of the program. This will be his third appearance already on the season. Um, so shouts to Garrett Temple. And more to come. And more to come. We'll see if he has more Raptors games than Raptors show appearances. <laughs> That'll be a game that we will play later today. Uh, and then an hour or two, I really wanted to pivot towards talking about Canada basketball a little bit as well. And the, for me, at least, two of the younger reporters who have really, really tapped in to what's happening at the grassroots level in Canada basketball all the way up to the very top are Orrin Weisfeld and Lee Van Osmond, friends of the program. We call them the off-strip boys because when they went to Vegas Summer League, they shared a room, and it was off the strip. And uh, they had Olive Garden, and they... <laughs> In any case, we call them the off-strip boys for that exact reason. Yeah, I did that, too, last year. Yeah, we, did you off also stay off-strip? Off yeah, it's yeah. cheaper. I mean, I know it's cheaper, but... Yeah, and I had a Vegas, really man. nice place, actually. It was a bachelor, kind of bachelor pad, had a kitchen, uh -huh. had some uh, frying pans for me. Okay. Yeah, everything I needed. Right. And then, yeah, I made a few long, long walks to the strip. Excellent. Whoa, you walked to the strip? I walked, bro. Because <laughs> it's, you, I, it's yeah, 40 degrees. It's 40 degrees. Yeah. I saw people, like, like pouring water like on their heads. Celsius, and not, not no, Fahrenheit. No, it was yeah. very, very hot. There business. is no jokes about that. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I didn't hear that drop. I'm sorry. Sorry, Darren. You really about business. <laughs> the business. I am about that business. Yeah. I'll make the walk. When you're discovering a new city, I've never been there before. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's a bad thing to, you know. Walk because, around? No, yeah, I, I, I you know, look, long, listen. long walk. It was long. It was long. Generally, I like doing that. Yeah. But Vegas, when it's that hot, mm -mm. I got some tacos there. Yeah. Um, I heard about them. What was the place called? Taco de Gallo or something like that. Mm. Walked in. It was like the humidity. It just punched me in the face. Oh, yeah. But yeah. the place was mm. packed with people. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So, that was um, a fun day. You know what was not fun? Well, Raptors <laughs> Pistons. You know, last night, again, paint, let's paint the scene. So yesterday in Toronto, not quite 40 degrees, but... It was beautiful. A very beautiful 20 beautiful. degrees in Toronto. Very yeah. rare occurrence in mid-March, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very just warm weather all winter. But it was 20 degrees. Everybody's out. I saw so many people in shorts. I was near Hyde Park. The amount of people in shorts. <laughs> and rightfully so. You know, the sun's out. You know, it's like everybody getting to enjoy their time. And I was out there enjoying my time as well. And then I realized, time's up. Go Hi, home. Uh, 7 o'clock. Raptors, uh, Pistons. And, um, you know, Raptors lost again, 113 to 104. Um, you know, uh, you once again continue to see a lineup that doesn't have most of their key players, obviously due to injuries or other absences. Raptors did lead uh, for a while there. But unfortunately, uh, second half, they kind of fall apart. Amit. What was your overall impression of watching this masterpiece, this glorious matchup? <laughs> uh, starting with the, I guess, overall, you I mean, things started to go wrong for them in the latter part of the second quarter. Um, talking defensively, I mean, the, the Pistons in the third quarter, they outscored them by a lot. But mm. we saw kind of everything, which was sort of, uh, it was foreshadowing what we're going to see in the third quarter. It was Cade making a lot of shots. The rebounding was a huge problem. The Raptors, they were out-rebounded 15-7 in the third quarter. Mm. And the Pistons shot... 17 free throws in that third quarter. And yep. uh, that's how they're, like, they weren't shooting very well, but they're oh. getting to the free throw line. It was a lot of rebounding issues, gang mm -hmm. rebounding. There was a possession where someone was shooting a free throw. I'm not sure who was on the Pistons, but it was four Raptors versus two Pistons. Yeah, and, and Jalen Duren got it. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking right? about. He got right there like, for the putback. boy, oh boy. But even the people that were out there for that, yeah. I don't even blame them. Like, it, it, there were some mismatches, right? They're oh, a pretty big yeah. team, and Jalen Duren is a problem. Dude, very, very good player. I had to look it up because uh, I... Here's the thing. This is where the Raptors season is at. So for a very long time in my career, I wrote 10 things on every Raptors game. And it was regardless. And I would always post it. It was always 10. It was shorter, and then it got longer. Uh, and then, it, you know, it used to just be a screen cap that I would put on social, and now it's become like an article. Mm -hmm. Last season, I was like, oh, man, a lot of these games don't deserve 10. So a lot of them, I, I, I pivoted to writing five things, especially after losses that were very consistent just five things. Yeah. Yesterday, when you and I were sitting and preparing for the show, uh, we sit near the assignment desk, at, you know, for the, the writers at Sportsnet. And Gary, Gary Mello, came over and is like, well, I hate to do this to you, man, but uh, our man Grange uh, is going to be flying out of Detroit. I, I, I guess, um, will you be able to write about this game? And I was like, 
you know what, Gary, for you, man, of course. You know, I got you. You Good know, dude. I wasn't planning to write about this game, yeah. but I got you, you know? And I told him, I was like, but it's probably going to be five, though. Hard. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then last night after the game, after the, the, re the React pod, after I sat down, thought about it, wrote down four items, and then I got to the fifth item, and I was like, you know what? This is going to be a new history. It's going to be four things tonight. <laughs> Anyway, the my number one thing is exactly what you talk about, which was the size issue. Yeah. Raptors across the board were just so much smaller than the other team. It was the same issue that took place um, in the previous games as well. I thought, obviously, Denver is a pretty big team. The way Portland was playing that night, they also had a lot of size mismatches. And then you play against Detroit. And you can say whatever you want about the Pistons, but they still started two seven-footers. Yep. Jalen Dern, right, uh, who had 23 rebounds and 24 points. The Raptors don't even have a center in their starting lineup, right? Kelly is a power forward yep. who's in his 11th season at age 32. Can't really jump, yeah. right? Not necessarily a physical player. He can do a lot of things offensively, but defensively not a center. And then you're surrounding him with four guards, mm -hmm. right? Bruce Brown, Emmanuel Quickly, Ochai Abaji, Grady Dick, they're all guards. Grady is the tallest out of the bunch, but again, there's only so much you can ask, you know, a skinny rookie to do sure. for you defensively on that front. So you're going to get mismatches. And then the point about Dern, and I was writing this yesterday. I was like, man, Darren's really young, but he's like, but he looks like that already. And he's playing like that already. And I looked it up. He's like, I think about 10 days younger than Grady. Mm. He's younger than everybody that took the floor oh. for the Raptors last night. Jalen Dern. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's true. And he yeah. looked like a man among boys yesterday. So, yeah. The, you know, that's that's what you learn when you read four yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the Raptors are at these days. They're making me write four, now ten. I wish you had the animation where you could just, like, scratch out the five and put four. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I did on WordPress. <laughs> I hit backspace <laughs> on five and I put four. <laughs> Kelly's going to be starting center for Canada this offseason, right? Yeah, well, that's, that's you know, that's something I will, I will be talking about in hour two because size will be a, a, a major issue for the Canadians as well. And, yeah. and it's usually been their Achilles heel in previous tournaments until last year at the, the World Cup. But they yeah, got I mean, different personnel though. They got Dylan, they got Dylan, they got Lou Dort who right. plays extremely big. So right. you have personnel Shea's around. quite athletic. Yeah. yeah. So you have pe people around him that can kind of offset some of the deficiencies that he can come up, mm -hmm. right? Like stretch five is amazing to have, especially in FIBA, but uh, rebounding will be a problem for Canada and it's a problem for the Raptors at mm -hmm. this very second. So how do you solve this? Like, is there anything that, you, that Darko can do at least within games? To try to, like, at least not be completely it's, overwhelmed. It's tough, man. Um, like, you're yeah. asking, like, it's not as if they have people that are, like, that much bigger, right? Um, so, you're like, are you asking Bruce Brown? Are you asking Grady Dick, Jordan Noara, Jalen McDaniels? He had, uh, he's had a couple of really strong rebounding games. But in the end, like, you're still down, like, 30 pounds against some of these guys and you're still yep. down like four or five inches mm. <clears throat> you can try your best like there was a possession a few games ago where it was against uh, denver where i actually loved that gfl or jfl rather mm -hmm. um he was boxing on michael porter jr and like <laughs> porter jr was like towering over him but he was trying so hard mm -hmm. to box the man out now porter got the rebound and uh jfl he he slapped out of his hand, hands and they went down the other side of the court but uh that's kind of what you're hoping for is that you just want them to try as hard as they can yeah. and be aware too and being aware on the defensive end has also been a problem for the Raptors. It was an issue last night. Uh, back cuts, you know, just knowing where your man is off ball, um, avoiding some of those cuts towards the rim, that was an issue for the Raptors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of just kept on persisting. And some of the lineups that they used, late third quarter, early fourth quarter, I mean, these aren't lineups that are going to help you win games, right? You have a lot of players that are very mm -hmm. experienced in these they're, situations. They're trying to win the lottery with, with yeah. some of these lineups. Well, yeah. and so I think yeah. that's a it's Just a say win your Gagne yeah. after this. <laughs> <laughs> but there were some good things, right? I mean, like, I loved how IQ played. Um, I loved how Jonte played, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some there were some good things that we're seeing from those players specifically last night. Kelly yeah, had a good sure. game. Um, but, uh, yeah, obviously, I mean, I mentioned it yesterday, too. Like, the Pistons, they have the guys that they're trying to go forward with, and they're playing. Mm -hmm. And the Raptors right now, I mean, Gary's not playing, Scotty's not right. there, RG's not playing. Like, a lot of guys hey. that weren't there. The one guy out there that was playing that I think is still, for me at least, like really worthwhile to tune in to watch uh, this player's growth is Emmanuel Quickly. Yeah. And uh, Quickly last night finished with 25 points, 5 rebounds, 8 assists, 8 of 19 shooting, so maybe a little bit less efficient than he has been. But to be honest, for me, it was just he missed a couple of threes and didn't get a couple of calls, whatever. Um, what I liked about Quickly's game, and it's been something that, uh, especially because we've gotten to see like about three months of Quickly now mm -hmm. as a Raptor yep. since the trade uh, with New York, 
is when he first got to Toronto, it was like, okay, he can shoot, he can handle, and he was already playmaking at that time, doing a good job of setting up the offense. But you saw it was a strange thing, but he just wasn't finishing or even going to the paint that often. Mm -hmm. Right, Settled for a lot of floaters, um, which he obviously can hit. He's a really good shooter of the floater, but wasn't going through the paint as much, getting all the way to the basket as much. Last night, I love the fact that quickly made sure to get mismatches, to attack mismatches, and whether it was Duran, whether it was Stewart, whether it was Wiseman, whoever, yep. he was making sure to get mismatches onto Detroit's many big men. And then even though he's small and those guys are seven-footers who are he's still young and pretty athletic, he was getting by them and making plays at the rim. And I think that, you know, you have to look at these small little developments when you're looking at these kind of games. And for sure. me, it, it has been very important for me to see quickly get better at finishing through contact um, and around bigs in the paint. What did you see from Manuel Quickly last night? Loved his game. I mean, aside from the shooting, but 8 of 19, like, that could be, uh, you know, 11 of 19 on a different day, right? He shot 2 of 8 okay, from 3, yeah. but I like the shots he was shooting. Mm -hmm. And other than that, man, his his IQ in the pick and roll, he's getting so much better at it. Like, he's becoming a lot more cerebral mm. when it comes to his ball handling. Like, he, it's not as predictable as it once was. Like, he's using his starter dribbles. He's uh, not afraid to you know, hold on to a little bit longer. He's maintaining his dribble. Yeah. He's making, he's surveying, he's making new decisions on the fly. And like, it helps having, you know, someone like Kelly who can uh, pick and pop a little bit. He found him a few times. But there's also a few, like, really nice bounce passes under the, under the rim to a few players. And these are, like, again, really positive signs for him. And... Also for the Raptors, like, I mean, I think in the third quarter, things went sour, especially with their defense. But at the same time, they stopped playing through their bigs. Mm -hmm. And offensive toughness, I think, is something that this team has to figure out. And it's something that a lot of inexperienced teams, they struggle with. And Darko talked about this last night. We're going to go to a clip in a second. But it's like having that that force and, and the, the experience to know where you got to go at certain points. What kind of possession do you need? Are you taking the temperature of the game? And Darko talked about that last night. I think it was a, an interesting clip that um, we should play right now, if we could. Yeah, uh, producers are going to work on that clip. Yeah. Um, but your point was that offensive toughness and executing at the right times and what to do at certain moments. And understanding momentum, really yeah. right? Knowing momentum. Like, when you're on the road, you have to be able to control the crowd, control the game as best you can. And that's not easy, right? But when a team is going on, like, a 10-0 run – you got to be able to slow it down. Say, okay, maybe we don't press right here. Let's pull it out. Let's let's go with a, a play that we know, a set that we we trust that won't mm. cause a turnover and stuff like that. That I'm hoping the Raptors kind of gain uh, experience on. Okay, so here's Darko on that exact point. In Detroit, uh, they wanted to start uh, the, the game really well. They they had a chance to see the way we opened the game against Denver. It's definitely a learning opportunity for us, and that's uh, that's something that we need to address how we're starting the games. But also, I talked to the team about uh, getting the feel when the game momentum of the game like we cannot turn over make a turnover now this is the moment we gotta re really rebound like the the moment the, the moments that change the, the really re rhythm of the game so that was uh that was a big message for us i thought that we had really good stretches of basketball we just gotta extend 20 minutes of really good basketball to 25 to 28 to 30 to 35 yeah um so to those to that point what is that like safety go-to play that they should be looking to right now for some stability? I think it is playing through their bigs with Kelly and and Jonte. Um, okay. it, it, it promotes player movement. Like mm. when you get uh, hesitant, um, when you're feeling unsure about yourself, you tend to just stop moving, right? And that's like that's not good for this Raptors offense, especially with how that's limited the only they way are. this offense scores. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. yeah. And so if they get into their big and they start, you know, doing some off-ball cuts, and, like, they have a lot of success. Like, we saw it against Denver. Mm -hmm. Like, And granted, you had R.J. Bear for that game, and he's one of the best at it on this team. Yep. But if you get the ball moving, if you get the players moving, um, and it, it also, like, you have two bigs who can shoot the ball. Now, you don't want them shooting at every single possession, but at the very least, you can I'll probably say that they'll get a decent shot out of it, even mm -hmm. if it kind of breaks down. You're going to get a good shot out of that, out of that possession, and you're probably not going to turn it over. Yeah. Right? Um, I think that's probably the way they have to go, and that's on IQ, that's on Darko, that's on Kelly, that's on you everyone, know, right? Here's the thing. I would say that, to me, that's not necessarily on IQ on Kelly because when when they're on the floor, at least the Raptors still have structure offensively. Yeah. When they come off the floor, and a lot of times they are both coming out the floor to, uh, in roughly the same moments because they're both starting, um, that's, to me, when the offense died last night. It was like fourth quarter, okay, it's Jonte Porter who mm -hmm. is doing his very best to be the traffic cop, as you mentioned, 
at the top of the floor there, holding the ball in the post, letting other guys cut. But then it's McDaniels getting shots. It's Jemias Ramsey last night getting shots. Yeah. It's Jordan Wara last night getting shots. And I haven't really liked what he's done off the ball. He's probably done better on the ball, but like, that's not the system. You're, you're not going to be giving the ball that much. Sure. You need to be able to cut and find your ways around it. When those guys started going really cold, and then Bruce Brown joined the mix, I think, at, at certain points too, that, to me, didn't work. And, of yeah. course, when Kelly and, and IQ came back in, they had maybe more of a chance to sort of study it and, and improve it. But, nevertheless, the momentum was already lost. So, yeah. for me, I, I, I agree with you. Like, I do think that getting into the post is the most important thing. But it's just like, unless they play quickly... More mm -hmm. than what he's already doing, which, by the way, since Scotty has gone down, quickly he's averaged uh, 38 minutes per game. Yeah. Um, yep. Your offense is going to die at some point. And I think for the second unit, when we did see for a brief stretch there, when the second unit was playing really well, Kelly was playing in that second unit and with Scotty. So you can have structure. Mm -hmm. Right now, like, the most structure they had was Jonte trying to be responsible and the rest of those guys, like a McDaniels, isoing, calling their own number, and it's like, yeah, you're, you're done yeah. if you do that. You're absolutely done. Yeah. I would like to never see that again. <laughs> I can't stress yeah. that enough, even in losses. <laughs> Tobias Ramsey, he uh, he had a, a very nice windmill, right? That was his lone uh, mm. dunk. Okay, hold on. Um, right. I, yeah. I wanted your yeah. thoughts on yeah. this too, because with with Ramsey, um, he I, I liked it, that he was giving a lot of energy on defense. Mm -hmm. um, I liked that. He made mistakes, uh, but yes, for sure. Yeah, he, he was he, trying. He was trying hard on defense, which honestly, for a ten day, like absolutely, you need to do that, yep. right? Um, he missed some open threes. He missed some open layups. Whatever. It happens. You know, it's not the worst thing in the world. The windmill down 10. Like, am I being a hater or being like, just just, just dunk the ball regularly? Yeah, it's risky. Okay? It's very risky. Yeah. Um, probably. Because uh, I feel like a like, hater as I say it. But yeah, I'm yeah. also the same. I'm like, just get the two. And he did get the two. He That's did. Good. Right? Yeah. And if he, if he missed it, like, yeah. it's a different conversation. Right? Yeah. Right? Like, now he's on uh, Shaq and the Fool, things like that, right? Um, but he made it, and I like that he had the confidence to do it, mm -hmm. and I'm happy it worked out for Dude, him. Dude, it was a highlight of the night. Yeah, yeah. it actually was. Yeah. Um, when I think back on Raptors Pistons many years from now, I'll be like, remember when Jamias Ramsey wearing 37 <laughs> did a windmill dunk down 10? It was nice, too, very yeah. smooth, like, good extension. Very good. Very, very nice. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I... I don't. I wouldn't hate it if he didn't do it. <laughs> it's not something you just want to do. Like it's, Dude, it's not a missed, typical play if, if for someone missed, in his been, position. It yeah, it would have been really, really bad. Yeah. But he made it. Yeah, he and did. he also had seven rebounds. Like he was hustling. He tried. Totally. And uh, we're talking about the the minutes when IQ wasn't on the floor. Like Jemias, he played 19 minutes. That's mm. a lot. Um, he was a minus 10. Bruce Brown was a, a minus 16. So you're right. Um, when the when IQ is on the floor, when Kelly's on the floor, like obviously it looks much much better. And yeah, sure. they they were much more productive uh, in their minutes. But um, when they go to the bench, it got a little bit worse. But Jonte Porter was pretty good. Jonte uh, was great, man. He was hustling. He yeah. had a lot of off-ball blocks, mm. off-ball steals. And mm. those are, like, signs of a player who's just, like, kind of locked in. He's in the right defense. positions. Exactly. You, that's the only way you're going to get yeah. those. Yeah. And he was even switching on to some guards, right? And he's blocking the ball. Like, mm. this is yeah. good stuff for, for someone, especially in, in his uh, position. Oche wasn't – not a great game for Oche. Not a great game. Yeah, I think there's, there's a conversation we have with Oche because I think um, – yeah, to, to the point about Jante, like, he, the fact that the whole game, the whole second unit was unserious. Yeah. Um, but what Jante was still trying to do the right thing and still didn't force a shot, like, by far he outplayed everybody on the bench mm -hmm. that came off the bench for Toronto. But he didn't force a shot. He didn't try to, like, it's not. It's my turn to, like, it's not McDaniels driving the lane one-on-one -on -one and putting it behind his back, then losing the ball and then tapping my bad. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. We, uh, that's a new drinking game, watching the Raptors. <laughs> Count how many times Jalen McDaniels taps his chest and says, my bad. Right? Right. Like, I would love to, yeah. yeah. yeah that's that's one way to enjoy the Hand Raptors' up. business. Hand up. Yeah. You my and bad your, guys. Yeah. But in any case, <laughs> with, um, yeah, with Jonathan, he's done a really good job being responsible. Ochai, to me, it's not not notable that the Raptors and Dark Horse Definitely been brought in to be a developmental coach. And yet with Ochai, it feels like down the stretch, he's the guy getting pulled. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and that's not against Darko. I think it's because Ochai is giving them very little. So last night you saw the Raptors actually close with two centers. And Ochai was the one who came out the floor with the mm -hmm. starters. I mean, 0 of 3 in 26 minutes. Uh, made the unselfish pass a couple times in transition. But defensively, he, he did okay. Did good, let's say even, right? But... Offensively, he did like less than zero. Yeah, and I think that's the little bit of a concern for me. What are you noticing for Ochai? Like, what's what's missing with Ochai that he can't 
make an impact offensively? Well, the offense is is one thing. Like, I think he's going to be a role player within the system. We know that. He yeah, has to sure. hit shots. He has to make smart cuts. And that's kind of that's going to be what he finish, most importantly. Yes, he does. Yeah. 100%. Um, the defensive end is kind of where my, I'm not sure about, because they kind of want to make him a bit of a defensive stopper, right? And mo- okay. he can he's very mobile laterally. Um, he can get around screens pretty well. But what's concerning about last night is that Cade was posting him up. Mm-hmm. Right, and they're similar heights, similar weights. And Whoa, Kate, no, is, Kate is bigger than him. Huh? Kate is bigger than Ochai. Six, two twenty, six five, two fifteen. There's one. We're talking I, one inch here. Oh, Och- Kate's a little taller. Like he, he but, could, he could definitely see over the top. You could shoot but over the top. It's one inch, right? One inch. I don't know. I feel like when you stand them side by side, they might not. There's clear yeah. the one guy's taller. That. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, but say oh, so maybe his right. Yeah. So he's a uh, but he's brought in to be a defensive stopper or yeah. a version of that on, along the perimeter. Okay. Um, I think it's concerning that in a matchup like that. Now, granted, OG and Anobi has had problems with Cade Cunningham. Right. He's yeah, a very sure. shifty yeah. guard. He's extremely talented. He cooked OG once in Toronto when when he was a rookie. I remember, right? man. Yeah. Like, he's very very good. Yeah. Um uh, But at the same time, it's he was so mismatched against Cade. And okay. if he's gonna be in this position to be a player that is going to be put on the best the best person on the other team, right? And that's kind of what his role is going to be. Because if it's not, then I'm not sure where he fits. But if he's not that person, right. then – and also offensively, there's limitations. He can finish in transition sometimes. That's good. Around the rim is still a little bit suspect. But uh, corner threes are good. Mm-hmm. Above the break, not so much. Um, it's like I'm trying to figure out like where does Oche fit in the future because that's kind of what we're doing right now with I all think these Darko's players. trying to figure out the same thing too. That's why yeah. you see his minutes be more inconsistent, even though for the other guys, you know, um, they're getting their time. But yeah, for Ochai, like what's concerning is when you have less responsibilities in offense and all you're basically asked to do is finish rather than create, that mm-hmm. should lead to you getting more efficient. Yeah. And he, I mean, whatever, he only took three shots last night, but still like, I don't feel that way. Like, when he's cutting and stuff, I don't feel like he's taking the right moments to try and finish. For me, he's, he takes off from too far out. He's, like, trying to get there with speed and athleticism and bursting to the basket rather than, like, trusting that he can take one more dribble and, like, finish strong at the hoop. Now, when he's dunking, he's he's dunked and he's finished. But generally speaking, on layups, he's, he's missed a couple of those. I think part of it is just the adjustment period. You know, there's been so much change in the whole system. And I feel like for the players who like Ochai, who can't get their own offense as much, it's even harder for them to continue to sort of thrive in this sort of system. I mean, having said that, though, yeah, I mean, this is a big opportunity for him, and I don't think he's really taking it. And so it's showing you some of the limitations in his game. But defensively, it's interesting because when he's a stopper, he's like, yeah, like he's like six four, right? He's not like physically overwhelmed. He's cut, right? But he's like, yeah, he's a he's a guard. Um, what are some like similar maybe body types that you see around the league of like really good stoppers that are like kind of like shaped and size like Ochai? You know what I mean? Because uh, like with OG, it was like okay, he's a defensive stopper because he's that big, that strong, that with that big of a wingspan, yeah. and he's also like moves his feet really well, and he's committed to that front. Sure. What are some comps for o- Ochai to sort of reach for? Like, are you well, like a Caruso? Like, I was about to say. So okay. I looked up uh, how much uh, Alex Caruso weighs. Mm. He's 186 pounds. But you would never know it. No, he's not. This, these are I'm, not accurate, man. I'm sorry. I'm looking at basketball reference. No, I know. No, I'm, it's not you. It's, it's not for that. No, but, there's no right. way. But yeah. the point is that yeah. they're very similar height, very similar mm. body build. Really right? cut, too. By the way, if, yes. you see, if you see Caruso up close, he's, yeah. Yeah. He's very cut. I haven't been that close before. Well. Not to him, at least. You got it. You gotta, yeah. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah. However, yeah. right, point being... Similar kind of statures, right? Yeah, However, right, yeah. you're able to put Alex Caruso on damn near anyone. Exactly. Why is that? Yeah. Right? And so it's a center of gravity. It's, again, it's experience. Um, he's, uh, I think he's very uh, poised. He's very balanced. Mm-hmm. And maybe, like, someone can be in good shape, but it doesn't mean that they have great balance. Mm. Right? I think they're very two di- very different things. Okay, you can be, yeah. You can have huge arms, but maybe your core, your strength, may not be exactly where it needs to be. Sure, That's yeah. a curiosity for me. Grady mentioned that uh, during his conditioning stint, one of the things they worked on was his core mm. and being more balanced on his shots. And obviously, it's paid off. I wonder if something like that could... I mean, I'm spitballing here because you see, like, he's obviously a very athletic dude. Mm-hmm. Um, but why is it that... Uh, in some of these matchups against players that he should be able to compete with, why is he getting blown by? Why is he able to? Why is he getting posted up? And uh, teams are successful against him. It's something that they have to be curious about. Um, I'm curious too uh, how this all goes for for Oche because again, like you said, it's a very big moment for him, kind of career defining because he's not like he's not that young, right? You no, have a, no, you no. have a window here yeah. to make uh, the most of it, and he's getting like, the Ochai minutes. Oche is like and, born 
yeah. in the same month as as RJ. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But second team now too. So you, yeah. again, you get more curious. And I believe um, when, I can't remember her name, when we had someone on from Utah Jazz, the beat, yeah, Sarah um, they had said they didn't want to get rid of Oche, right? They didn't mm. want to include him in the trade, but they felt like they had to. And it's interesting actually that. I mean, they didn't want to get rid of him. They didn't need to get rid of him. <laughs> they clearly were willing to get rid of him. True. Yeah. 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 Devin Booker was on uh, JWX podcast last night. Yeah. Well, at least it was released. Right. And he had mentioned that, like, early on in his career, he had a, a phase of his son's season where he was able to go out there and make mistakes and mm. he didn't have to worry about being pulled out. Right. And he's like, that is like what, that is a dream for a young player. Okay. And, okay. and uh, a lot of these guys are having that opportunity right in front of them. Now, yes. it's uh, it's cool that they're getting it. It's cool that it's, they're a little bit, you know, they're making the most of it in some mm -hmm. to some degree. But, um, you can't take this opportunity for granted because it doesn't come along all the time. Usually when you make yeah, mistakes, you get pulled. Sure. And usually when you're not doing things on offense, uh, you're not focused, you're not mm. uh, following the game plan, usually that means that you're you're out. Yeah, They're able to play through these mistakes. And uh, for Oche, for a lot of these guys, like <coughs> you got you to gotta find a way to get to that level of uh, focus mm -hmm. and intensity and fire yeah. every single minute you're on the court. Um, there's just too many guys right now that are vying for these minutes on on the team, and like we saw, like JFL, I love him, but he didn't play last night, mm -hmm. right? Jemias Ramsey got the, got those minutes, and maybe yeah. you can say they want to get a look at him, but also if JFL was doing his part, maybe he would have you know got those minutes, right? Yeah, so, for sure. I mean, the reality of the situation is half these guys won't even be on an NBA roster next year that we saw in the game last night. Yeah, and they're defining that on both right ends. Now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. on both sides for Toronto and Detroit. So. Yeah, as you mentioned, these are very key opportunities. I think Ochai will be, though. I, I think it's just he's not a guy who creates for himself, and the Raptors' offense ain't creating that much right now. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult, but he's got to learn and adapt and grow. And yeah. that's one of the things is, like, very few players in Darko's offense is just there to be, like, spoon-fed. Yeah. You have to be able to do multiple things. And so that's up to him to grow and develop as well. But Raptors lose last night. This will be the last time we talk about this game. And uh, <laughs> speaking of how to stick on an NBA roster, we'll talk about that on the other side of this break. When we bring in Garrett Temple, I can't wait. Um, but we're going to take that break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, William Lou. Join me on the program, and uh, everything goes well. I think we're going to have them every week. Raptors, veteran, Garrett Temple, Already your third time on the program, Garrett. I appreciate you taking the time, man. No problem, uh, Will. It's great, great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I feel like, um, first off, I feel, I feel very relieved that you're not wearing the suit, man. Because I, I look down on myself and I'm like, I'm just in a hoodie right now. It's a little OVO hoodie, you know. It's fine, but if you had the, if you had the suit on, this would be a mismatch. That's all I'm saying. No, we both got the hoodies on. You know what I'm saying? I got my my <laughs> yeah. rest hoodie on. You know, you got your OVO. We we matching today. Yeah, exactly. No, we got a. Yeah, one of these, I want you to put on the suit for the interview, and I'm, I'm going to do the same, and uh, we'll make it look super formal. Um, anyway, so one thing I wanted to talk to you about, just starting with the team right now, is, um, you know, the Raptors, I don't know if you've been part of a season like this, where it's like there's like four teams in one, you know what I mean? Just starting off, like you guys had the original starting five, and you guys were trying to compete, didn't really work out, then OG gets traded as another team now with quickly and RJ with the rest of the group with Scotty and Pascal leading the way. Then Pascal gets moved. Now it's a new group. And now you have this instance where a lot of injuries are happening and you're seeing a lot of young guys come in. So have you ever been a part of a season like this where you're basically like four teams in one? No, I, I, I haven't. Um, this is definitely the first time I've ever been a part of, as you said, this many different lineups, um, this many different, uh, you know, sets of players that are playing this many different rotations uh this is new to me um and it's a, it's a great learning experience uh it's, it's, i'm glad i'm i'm able to be a part of it um if you look at guys like grady mm -hmm. uh in his rookie year to be able to be a understand and, and see this early on will make him you know i think it'll just allow him to be able to uh, transition throughout his career a lot easier so it, it's it's been interesting but uh you know we're making the best of it yeah, I think it's interesting, too, because with Darko, he's used a phrase like we're kind of treating this like a training camp. And he's, he's he said it a couple of times. So I, I've been wondering for you guys in practices, like how would you compare maybe practices at the start of the season versus like, I guess, you know, such a later on in the year practices get less and less anyway. 
but what practice is like now with a lot of new guys who are like very very new to the whole city and the organization yeah it's it's as if we um you know the nba is is pretty simple in terms of a lot of people do the same things so getting in guys like quick and uh and rj early on just have to talk about terminology and then getting bruce and jordan in again you're talking about you know different terminologies and then getting kelly in and ochai kind of the same thing um, but we actually kind of switched we changed our defensive concepts and, and our language so that was a whole new thing um and then how obviously having guys like jamias and um and obviously jante coming back mm -hmm. It's a whole different defense than when he was really playing at the beginning earlier on earlier yeah. in the year. And Javon the same way. So we're definitely treating it like training camp. And we still at the end of the day, we we, we have a young team. Yeah. So you're going to be teaching and learning throughout the entire season. Um, and that's where we're definitely doing that, except to, I guess, a higher extent because of all of the change we've had. All right. So it's really interesting you're talking about this new defense. What, what's what are the broad differences and also when did this change come in um you know we we're, we're weaking and st stronging things now we're okay. in terms of pick and roll so our pick and roll defense we kind of went back a little old school mm. um uh we're not sending everything to the middle like we were before um and obviously teams that have watched us over the past probably eight games are seeing that now mm -hmm. um so this is not like it's insider information a home uh so we're trying to we're, we're trying to this is helping us protect the paint a little better uh keeping things on the side of the side of the floor um whereas before we would send things middle and try to you know rely on our help defense but teams are shooting three so so much better now so you have to find different ways and um the league is a league of you know things change trends come in and they go out you know uh so that that's the biggest thing, utilizing our our help, um, our low man a little more, and making sure we keep keep guys out of the paint, especially without having Yak. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, you know, with, with having a rim protector like like Yak, um, a big body in there, we need to you know find other ways to try to keep guys out of the paint. Yeah, to protect the paint. So that's that's the biggest thing. Yeah, no doubt. And even with some of these strategies, you might still run into a guy like Jalen Dern, who I, I couldn't believe that that guy's younger than Grady, man. <laughs> it's it's insane, man. We were talking about that on the bench. We were, every time I yep. see this guy, he's like a, he, he's built like a superhero. Yep. And he's 20 years old. It, it makes no sense yeah. at all. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, what, what do you have, 24 and 24 against us? It's Basically. 25 and 24, something like that. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's a, he's a, you know, a, a lot of instances, he's a man, man amongst boys. And, um, and he's the youngest one on the court, which is, yeah. uh, un unbelievable. I, yeah. I kind of felt bad he's for tough. Kelly in a little bit, you know, I'm like, Kelly, I, I know you're 32 and you played a lot of power forward in your career. <laughs> now right. you got to do this. Um, <laughs> exactly. He, K KO is a, is a stretch four, you know, yeah. uh, uh, most of his career, but, uh, with the situation we we're in, you know, he got a battle. Yeah. Um, and he did a great job. You know, he had a, a, a hell of an all around game. Yeah. Um, that's what, you know, Kelly can really pass for us, can really set the tone offensively. And I will say, Jonte did a great job. Jonte's you know, good. Battling. Yeah. Jonte, Jonte had a, I, I would say his best game last mm -hmm. night because of everything else besides just scoring, just the way he, had, he, he played the game, the energy he had, the, the, um, you know, his effort. Um, his competitiveness on the defensive end and rebounding. I was really proud of what he did last night. Yeah, no doubt, man. I think for Jonte, you know, you could tell that he is in the right positions. You know, he's not jumping out the gym like Jalen Dern, but, you know, at the same time, he's in the right position. He's meeting guys. His energy was great. Darko uh, complimented all the deflections that he got. You know, I think one of the, the topics of conversation coming out of that game like that was like, you know, the Raptors have a lot of guys who – you may be able to relate to based on sort of your path to the league, right? Like coming in, you've been, and this is a crazy stat that I only saw uh, this morning, but you've been on eight different 10 day contracts in your career when you were starting out. That's, that's gotta be a league record first off. All right. That's got, that's like a CBA labor violation, quite frankly. <laughs> I, I think it, I think it is. I think it is a record. Yeah. I think it is a record. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and you've joined different teams midway through the season. You've had to really adapt 
been on, you know, league minimum contracts, maybe unguaranteed contracts at certain points too, where you don't know your future. So I think that's similar to a lot of guys on the Raptors right now. And I guess my question is like, what was it for you that allowed you to stick, not just on the court, but maybe even off the court? And how does somebody in that kind of position like make an impression on a team and ultimately carve out a long-term career that I'm sure they're all hoping to do? No question. That's a great question, Will. You know, and that's one reason why I'm I'm happy I'm in the spot I'm in because mm-hmm. of guys like DJ, because of obviously guys like Jemias, guys like Javon, who just got, you know, his first standard deal, Jante. Um, just being able to pour into these guys and explain to them on the on the court what you need to do is be the best version of yourself, not try to be anything different. They brought you in because they liked your game. So don't come in if you're a defender that, you know, gets downhill, don't come in trying to shoot threes, you know, and, and lack on defense. Uh, so just be yourself. They brought you in because of who you are. Um, and then be very low maintenance. So don't be, you know, uh, a bad locker room guy. Mm-hmm. Don't be a guy that complains a lot. Don't be a guy that, uh, you know, if, if you have a, just being honest, if you have a, Kind of a nagging little injury. Yeah, you gotta unless play through those. You gotta play through it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If unless it's crazy, you gotta play through it. Now, if it's a bad ankle, bad bad ankle sprain like DJ had, obviously mm-hmm. that's different. Um, but just understanding the opportunity you have and how a lot of them don't come around mm-hmm. for guys like us that were undrafted and things of that nature. So, just being grateful for the situation you're in, not complaining about playing time mm-hmm. when the coach does put you in, whether it's for a minute. You know, 38 seconds, 22 minutes, whatever it is, play as if your career depends on it because it actually does. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and, you know, mentally just play free. Right. You know, you, Jemias, 10 day contract. You know, I told DJ this when he was on his 10 day, just play free. Don't think about making mistakes. You're going to make them regardless. So just play your game, play free. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're probably going to play to your best ability. And, um, and then mentally, just if it's not for you, if this team is not the team you're supposed to be on, remember you're not playing just for this team. There are 29 other teams looking at you. Right. And that that could sign you. You know, I had one season where I was on three different NBA teams my rookie year. Yeah. Um, because my rookie year, I was with the Rockets, and then I left the Rockets, and I played against – I played with the Sacramento Kings two days later in Houston. <laughs> And then okay. I left. I left Sacramento after uh, the ten day, and I played with the Spurs. So yeah, you know, right. against Sacramento. So that's everybody's looking, everybody's watching. And um, when you're on a ten day contract, it's not just the Raptors that are paying attention to you. Mm. It's the whole entire league. Do you remember what your first big break was? Like the first time you were like, oh, this happened. Now I got, I got some peace of mind because you know the way you're describing it. Like you're grinding and you have no idea what's going to happen next. No, no. Cl- no clue. Lucky for me, I was, I didn't have a, uh, um, you know, I had a girl my rookie year, but I didn't have obviously anybody to take mm-hmm. care of. My first big break, uh, I went to training camp with Miami and they really liked me. This is right after they won the first championship. Okay. But they decided to go with somebody that was on the team the year before. So after about nine games in the G, in the D league, then, the Washington Wizards called me up for a workout. I worked out really well, but they decided not to not to take me. Then six days later, they called me and told me they wanted me to sign with them. But I had, you know, my agent had talked to Miami and told them, we kind of will give you first right of refusal. Right. And so Miami said, well, we want you. We, you know, we picked the wrong guy. We wanted to, we wish we had, we wish, wish we had picked you. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of had already gave Washington my, you know, they called and said, do you want the, the non-guaranteed contract? I said, yeah, for sure. I'm uh, not on NBA team. Yeah. Then the next day, we reached out to Miami just to let them know. And they were like, oh, no, we want you. So I had to choose between okay. the defending champion Miami Heat yep. or a 3-22 and Washington Wizards team. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I went with my gut and knew that, you know, even though Spo called me, Dave Fisdale called me, mm-hmm. they tried to recruit me. I went with my gut and went to the Wizards because of the fact that I was going to have a chance to play. Yeah. And I played. I was on a non-guaranteed deal. Mm-hmm. It was early December, late December. I was on a non-guaranteed deal for about 20 days. And uh, the guaranteed date hit, and I made the roster. Um, the first big break was actually 
the second game of that deal, when I played against the Orlando Magic, I was the backup point guard. Mm -hmm. And Jameer Nelson was playing really like was had like 14 points against our starting point guard. So they put me in a game to defend him. I played really well and I started the second half. Oh. And then I started the rest of the games. Damn. Um so uh and they decided to keep me and release the uh the guard that was uh ahead of me. Right. So um that was the first big break and I signed guaranteed deals since then. Did you do anything to celebrate that? Was there like <sighs> I didn't. I no, nah, I didn't. It was just okay. you know, I made I made that team and then the next summer I signed a one year deal with DC. And I was just excited, man. I was yeah. I was ecstatic. Yeah. I you know, I was looking at the basketball reference page today. Um and first off, do players check their own basketball reference page? Like, is that a thing? Have you ever opened up basketball uh, reference and I, looked at your own resume? Yeah, we we yeah, I have. We we, <laughs> okay. we definitely check basketball reference because it's just so simple. Like it is if we're yeah. looking up guy's stats if we want to like having a debate about who's better or uh -huh. what do, what they do this that guy averaged this when, when did he average 18 a game he never averaged 18 you look yeah. at a basketball reference it's very simple okay you can see his playoff stats all of that stuff because <laughs> you know that's what yeah. we in the media do <laughs> it's i mean yeah we're fans just like y'all yeah we're fans just like y'all damn i didn't know that okay um yeah i was open up basketball reference base and i realized like i had completely forgotten about this but you had you were part of that wizards team that swept the raptors back in 2015 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I remember Lou Will was that was the year Lou was there. Yeah. He you know, was. The Raptors used to run basically this Allen Iverson uh, loop play for Lou to get down to his left hand mm. all the time. Always the left we just, hand. We just we just yeah. we just trapped it. We just ran our big man. We ran Nene out there to trap him before he even caught the ball. Yeah. And uh, Coach Case never he never switched up. He never he hey <laughs> he kept trying to run it with Lou in the game. So I saw <laughs> Coach Case last night. Um. <laughs> But yeah, four yeah, zero. We had a lot of great first round. Uh, the year before, we had a first round. We beat the Bulls four mm. one, I think, mm. when Jimmy and Nene got into it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we had a great some some great first round um, games, you know. But second round, we 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 couldn't get past Atlanta. Right. I want to say both times, Atlanta, both times. Right. You you were also there when um what was the one where John Wall jumped on the table? After game six? I no. Think, was that John I Wall? I wasn't Bradley? there. No? Okay. That was John Wall. That was John Wall. I wasn't yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't there that, that then. I was there when Paul Pierce called game. Ah. Uh, uh. But I wasn't there when John jumped on the table. That was the year after I left. <laughs> and I actually, yeah. that was when they played Boston. Uh. And I actually went to, uh, I went to watch him play game seven in Boston. Got you. Um, yeah. 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 Paul Pierce, um, two years in a row, I sent the Raptors packing. For a while, there was this there's <laughs> there's this infamous clip where uh, Paul Pierce actually beat the Raptors. I think it was with the Nets at the time, and he was like, you know, as Paul Pierce does, he likes to talk a little trash or whatever. And he like took off his headband sure. and he threw it into the crowd, and the Raptors crowd threw the headband right back at him. Man, they're like, nah, get out of here. <laughs> I love it. That that sounds about right. Yeah, I love the Raptors fans, man. Shout out to the Raptors fans for sure. Man. Everywhere, yeah, everywhere I've been, you know, Detroit, it sounded like a home game for us. Yeah, man. for so sure. We, just just a shout out to the Raptors fans. Mm -hmm. Canada, Toronto really, really represents everywhere we go. Yeah. Um, hey, I wanted to ask you, speaking of your career now, and, and again, I was looking at the Bass reference page, and I, and I realized, I was like, you know, how many players in the league right now got more tenure? More tenure than Garrett Temple right now, right? And uh, that's a nice way of saying, that's a fancy nice way of saying who's older than Garrett Temple in the league right now. Right. And sure. uh, I looked up the list. You are fifth in the league right now. It's just the oldest active players in the league. So... I wanted to see if you can guess the four guys ahead of you and maybe even the rest of the guys in the top 10. But uh, So just, just age, yeah. age-wise? Just age-wise, okay. not, not, not longevity yeah. in the career. Right? Um, LeBron. Of course. Uh, Kyle Lowry. Yeah. PJ, PJ Tucker. Oh, that's, that um, was a tricky one. That was the one I thought you might, you might trip up on. No, because I played against PJ in college, and okay. I, was a true, I was a redshirt freshman when he was a – junior or a senior i want to say right his junior year so i knew i know pj's older than me uh pj kyle braun um chris paul yeah um those are the four those are the four those are the four yeah yeah for sure yeah i i, I yeah. didn't know you would get kyle because kyle was only older than you by like a month you know but me and kyle know each other but we were really close so yeah. we roomed together in high in high school at an all-american game oh okay so he's born he's born march his birthday is this month i want to say 
It's around the trade deadline because there's one year when the Raptors were playing in Tampa. Everyone thought Kyle was going to get traded at that deadline because he was coming into so last year of his deal. That, so, yeah. the, so the Tampa year, it was deadline because so the deadline oh, was right. coming back. So his yeah, birthday's right. March. Right, yeah, right. His birthday's March. Yeah. Yeah. We always joke about how who's older by a few months. <laughs> you say the other five, though. So the other five. Yeah, go ahead. Wes Matthews. That, yo, that's a that's a deep cut, man. Shout out to Wes Matthews. Got the start last night for the Hawks. Wes Matthews. Yeah, I saw that. I saw yeah. that play 14. Yeah. Um, uh, I got to go with, oh, Je- Wes Matthews, Jeff Green. Jeff Green, of course. Um, I want to say Joe Ingles. That's a great That's a great pull. That's number 10 on this list right now. Active, okay. oldest active players. Yep. Um, next, I'm going to go with, I got to go with Patty Mills. Patty Mills, not on the, I, I got up to 12 right now. List. I don't see his name up here. So. Dang, okay. Yeah. Um, not Patty. Who else we got, man? If you Maybe want, I can give you some hints. Just, but uh, I'll give you good hints. Are they, not real. Not, okay, not give like me, give me a hint. Well, yeah. Number nine on this yeah. list was a Raptor twice in his career, like two separate stints with the Raptors. James Johnson. Yeah. 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 James, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then the other, the other one, this player is uh, quick math here 20. Six days younger than you, and has spent basically his entire career in the in the Eastern Conference. Twenty six days younger, and he's been yeah. his entire career. Um, so he's born in May, June. So he's born in June. Yeah. Um, early June. A, a great college get... career, and also a, a really good NBA career as well. Multiple time All Star, but really good college career as well. Is he um, is he in the rotation for somebody? Oh yeah, yeah, he's in the rotation for sure. He's in the rotation. Sure, he's, coming off, sure. he's coming off the bench, but he, he's like a good player. He's he's been a good player for a long I'm time. Tripping, hold yeah. up. No, I'm not tripping. Um, he's been in the Eastern Conference pretty much his whole career. Is he, is he in the East right now? Still, he's in the East right now. Yeah. What position does he play? He's uh he he started off the power forward, and as most power forwards become. They become centers. Centers. Yeah, he's. Um. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I'm tripping. I'm I'm tripping. I'm big tripping. Wow. Yeah. Man, Al Horford. Of course. SEC guy. Yeah. Of course. There you go. And uh, D Rose got to be up there too. D Rose not on this list. I only got up to twelve. Uh, it says Mike Conley. I'm here. Uh, he's Mike thirty-six. Conley. I'm tripping, Mike. And then Javale McGee. Yeah. I wasn't expecting him to be the twelfth oldest player. Shouts to Javale, man. Wow. You were with Javale. I, I don't sure. know if you were. You guys overlapped in Washington or not? Yeah. No, no. I came. I came after him. But okay. but uh, Javale is my guy yeah. for sure. All right. Oh well, yeah. What about Taj? T- yo. Yeah. I, by the way, I saw t- you, you. Taj was with the Pistons last night. I forgot he was he's on the with Pistons. The Pistons. Yeah. Ta- Taj is definitely. A year younger, like gotcha. around my age. I feel like he's the same age as me. Yeah. Well, I, hey, listen, no offense to Taj, you look way younger than Taj Gibson. <laughs> Yo, when Taj got drafted, when Taj, me and Taj have the same age. When Taj uh-huh. got drafted out of USC, uh-huh. I was like, Taj, Taj you're not, you're is younger. I was like, Taj is younger than me, but I, and, and he's a <laughs> junior and, high, and he's a year older than me. Though. Uh-huh. I wasn't saying Taj has had that, that, uh, that ball. Todd's been balding since you know yeah. a minute. That's my guy, though. Yeah, no, they can't all be blessed like you, man. You know, like the, the hairline <laughs> is still very much intact. Garrett, this is a great time, man. Yeah. I got to call and catch up with you next week as well. I'll, I'll come up with a little quiz, maybe not just about the oldest players, but I appreciate you taking the time, man. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll call you again next week. Always will. Let's do it, baby. All right, there you go, Garrett Temple. Man, not every day you could just you could just go play guess who with an NBA player. But that was fun. Shouts to Garrett Temple. And yeah, we will call him next week. Anyway, we're going to take another break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chucky Spice Suit. When we come back, the off-strip boys. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Wayne Malou. Big thanks to Garrett Temple for joining us on the program. And yeah, the, I think the plan and the hope is we just get Garrett Temple once a week and just just chop it up. It was great. It felt very like a vibe, just like the two of us just chatting about basketball. And I think that's sort of the goal that we would have. But it was great to, to get some insights, especially on the Raptors changing their defense. And that that's something that 
I actually really wanted to discuss with my two next guests here. Lee Van Osman of the Toronto Star, Oren Weisfeld of the Guardian. What's going on? We got global superstars in the building. Whoa, man. chill. The Guardian, dog. The Gu- Okay, the Guardian, yeah. The Guardian? Big in the UK. Star. Yeah? They love me, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. I don't want to hear that again. Goodness. <laughs> no, but crazy. how do we go from Garrett Temple to this? <laughs> What's going on? Do you think your combined ages are are, are, are is is more than Garrett Temple's age? Oh, that's a good question. Yes. Yeah, come on, yeah. don't be rude. Yes. Don't be rude. Not I have to make though. sure because Lee Man's pretty young. So. Whoa, I'm about to turn twenty five. Come on, big age. You're about to turn twenty five. When? Damn, twenty third, man. This Raptor oh. season has really aged us. Are oh, we having a board? He, he, was, he was eighteen when he this season started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Appreciate you guys for joining. You'll be here for the full hour. We're going to talk Canada basketball as well. Actually, I'll give you guys the choice. You guys want to talk Raptors defense right now, or you guys want to talk Canada basketball right now? You wanna, go ahead. I was going to say, you want to get the Raptors out of the yeah, way? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> okay. Let's do that. Let's do that. This, this man said, we've got to get the Raptors out of the way on the Raptors show. That's my goal every day. <laughs> um, okay, Raptors defense. And it was great to hear that from Garrett because, um, you know, a very few people I picked up on that. I know I had not picked up on the fact that the Raptors had changed their entire defense in the last eight games or so. Um, but the overall, the Raptors since December 1st, because the Raptors actually started the season guarding pretty decently, but it started going downhill even with the previous group, and then it just got getting worse and worse, and of course, Jakob's injury. But since December 1st, so this is like more than three months now, the Raptors are 29th in defensive rating. Um, briefly, the Detroit Pistons, or fresh for a long time, the Detroit Pistons were below the Raptors at 30th, um, and then now the Utah Jazz are at 30th. I think Detroit's 28th. In any case, the Raptors are the second worst defensive team for the bulk of the season. So, um, Oren, I'll start with you. Why have the Raptors been so bad defensively? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just roster turnover. Like, at a certain okay. point, it's really hard to have a good defense when you have new guys playing every ter- every game. And it's not just roster turnover. It's mm. injury turnover, too, more recently. Um, that's the biggest thing. Like any coach who's trying to put in a system, like you said, they change it out of necessity because Pirtle got hurt. But anytime you're trying to put in a system, you want con- continuity. You want to have practices to improve stuff. And when a new guy is playing every day, you know, even these 10 days playing from mm-hmm. one game to the next, it's almost impossible to have a good defense. Right. The other thing is with Pirtle, like, they're getting out rebounded like crazy without Pirtle since he went down, and mm-hmm. and I know you stretch it back to December first, but even if you go back that far, mm-hmm. Thad Young was the backup center, yeah, right, and he right. couldn't rebound or protect the rim mm-hmm. at the level you need. So you've either had that guy or or no Pirtle. It's really hard. Cody Wiles from Raptors Republic. I just saw this mm-hmm. this tweet. He said the Raptors are two and fourteen without Pirtle this year and minus sixty in the rebound game last five games. So, um. Those are probably the two big, biggest reasons for right now why it's been so bad. Lee, man, what about you? I agree with that. Um, yeah, roster change. You were on here a couple of days ago just guessing the 28 players on the roster. Yeah. Like, that's a big, like, that's crazy. <laughs> 28 um, is a ridiculous number. I that can, didn't even count Christian Coloco, who yeah. I count as he was fully on the roster around the team. So that should be 29, really. Yeah. And, and for yeah. me, it's like, it's that. It's, there's an identity crisis. Like, mm. I just don't know. Like, with Nick Nurse, you knew what to expect. The team was going to play hard. They were going to pressure yeah. the ball. Like, mm-hmm. there was an identity there, Fake right? comeback. Yeah, fake comebacks. Yeah. Like, you knew that was happening. Game. But to me, too, it's, like, also just, like, watching them, like, whether it's guarding the pick and roll, there's always just lack of communication. Mm-hmm. You can just tell these guys haven't practiced that much together yeah. often, you know? Um, which sucks when you obviously have so many trades and roster mm-hmm. turnover. Um, also, for me, too, it's just, like, I don't think it just started this year. I think it was, like, a thing that was slowly happening mm. and, and i think it starts off at top i think a lot of like the leadership with the raptors when you look at um when we had Kawhi, when we had kyle when we had danny mm. when we had marcus all those guys were able in my opinion like when they spoke yeah everyone listened yeah you fall in line you follow you listen yeah. but then as they went by you had guys like pascal og and fred and um i don't blame them for this but in my opinion, like, Pascal wasn't a vocal leader, right? Mm, like, he's yeah. not someone that's going to, like, call you out defensively for your mistakes. Right. OG, too. Like, I would never imagine OG, like, sitting down with somebody, breaking down film of, like, what you did wrong. Mm. He's not that type of person. In my opinion. Maybe he did, maybe he did not. Like, Fred was that person. But, like, at times we could say, like, people didn't want to listen to Fred, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's totally fair. From that point of view, it's like, you think about it in that leadership aspect to where 
you thought maybe Pascal and OG and Fred could turn into that. It didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. And now we moved on, right? And it's like, who, 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 and you want your main players to be that vocal leader, right? Right, yeah. No offense to like Dad Young, mm -hmm. Garrett Temple, Dennis Schroeder. Like, mm -hmm. if they're telling me something on defense, I'm not listening. Like, mm -hmm. at least from a perspective to where it's like, it doesn't hit you, the same as when it, Kyle told yeah, you to do that. Yeah, exactly. Back yeah. Or, but okay. I, to me, like, it comes best from the top guys, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Dennis, I think he tried, but it's like... But, bro, they just brought Dennis in. Like, exactly. how was he supposed to come in and just be the vocal leader for the whole team? Exactly. Like, that's... That was unrealistic. That's yeah. a bad plan, even though that was the plan. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, just to some a couple of stats to throw at you here. So, the Raptors' the defensive rating, at least on basketball reference right now, is 118. Um, that would be the highest offense rating they've ever had. However, that's also error adjusted, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're also in a really inflated scoring error. Again, I was going to throw this stat at Garrett Temple, but when he entered the league, it was 0-9-10. The, the NBA average, the average across the board for teams was 100 points. A team would score 100 points a game. This year, the average for a team scoring is 115. So that's already a 15% bump just over the last, like, 15 years. So, of course, defensive rating is going to naturally rise um so you can't necessarily compare what you can do is compare relative defensive rating so that's your current defensive rating versus the average defensive rating of the nba that year right so back in the day if you allowed 110 and the league average was 100 then clearly you know you're a bad defense nowadays if you average 110 given up but the average is 115 points given up you're actually a good defense so this is relative defense raptors relative uh to the league differential in terms of a defensive rating um it's it's the worst that the M the Raptors have been relative to the rest of the league since 2011. Damn. And that was like Jay Toronto years. <laughs> 09, 09 10 was, was pretty bad. 2010 11 was pretty bad in terms of just like the Raptors really couldn't guard. And then past that, you got some expansion years in there. You just throw those out. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've read prehistoric. There's a lot of messy, <laughs> messy stuff going on. Shouts to Alex. But like, yeah, basically it hasn't been that bad since the Jay Toronto era. So defensively, for me, it's like, how much of this also comes from not having the personnel and also just a total shift in how the Raptors are putting together the roster? In terms of they were really bringing in defensive first players and now bringing in offensive first players. How Essentially, how much is this a front office decision as well? Yeah, that's what I was actually going to bring up. And identity crisis is a great way of putting it. Like, I love that. Um, because defensively, they have an identity crisis. Offensively, they don't have that. Like, I like a lot of the stuff Darko has done offensively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's a ball movement coach, right? Yeah. And whether, and this is something I would be curious to really know Masai and Bobby's real thoughts on it. Yeah. Whether it was just because those were the players that were available or these were the types of players they wanted to target, mm. the type of players they got are offense first guys. Kelly Olynyk, RJ Barrett, Emmanuel Quickly. They drafted Grady. They drafted Grady. Great point. Like, those four guys are all offense first guys and out went these vision six, nine defense first players. I think honestly that a lot of it had to do with the way the league is trending. And it's just like the stats you just mentioned, mm -hmm. the league is going to a, a place where in the past you had to be an elite defense to win a championship. That is no longer the case. And you still have to have a good defense to win a championship, but offense matters way more than it ever has. So I think, Credit to the Raptors front office for recognizing that, right? Like, they made a decision to pivot to get more offense first guys in the building. But the downfalls to that are obviously you have to figure out a way to string together an okay defense. Do I think they can do it? You mentioned, like, personnel. Scotty and Pirtle as a 4-5 combination is good. Like, mm -hmm. especially Scotty turning into the rim protector he turned into this year. Like, that really helps. But to me, the biggest question not just like on the defensive end for the Raptors, but probably the biggest question like overall for how this this core of players is going to reach that next level is who is that starting two, three guard? Like the Gary Trent Jr. position. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a lot of fans will say Grady Dick. Grady Dick next year, he gets a start and that's your starting five. Well, between Emmanuel Quickly, Grady Dick, and RJ Barrett, it's just so many guys to attack. It's mm -hmm. so many. It's three guys that the premier stars of today's game will look at and just be like, this is a mismatch. Mm -hmm. I can take this. I think they need to find that 3 and D wing, that OG and an OB type. <laughs> we need to find a Vision 6-9 type of player. And we knew this when yeah, we traded yeah. OG. We knew yeah. we were gonna we were gonna miss him. But but to me, it's it's a huge personnel thing. And no one on the roster, you guys talked about Ochai in the first section. 
he he's not big enough to do that or or at least he hasn't developed into that kind of defender yet and uh no one on the roster to me really fits that mold of, of who's going to be that three and d lockdown wing yeah i personally just don't, don't don't think this roster at its core will be able to defend at an elite, elite level um which is why like you're kind of happy with having picks in the draft like mm -hmm. there's some guys in this class that you look at that could potentially be game changers defensively and to me scotty when i talk about like having that vocal leadership that we didn't have with pascal with fred with og i think scotty will grow into that mm -hmm. he's still what 22 years old like yeah when you think about it like he's had his moments where whether it's not running back on defense we, we, we went through all that kind of stuff to me it's like the kid's 22 years old and the fact that he the the, the off-ball defense the rim protection that he provided um i'm not worried i think he will be able to um sort of just like create like be able to put to push the message out that whether it's the coaching staff is saying to him or just like be able to be that vocal leader that you need mm -hmm. that that's gonna like um like make up the mistakes for others you know so yeah. um i just think obviously we kind of talked about it what was the last once you trade og you didn't have uh, losing Kawhi. we were searching for a small forward for years mm -hmm. for this team right oh yeah we had damari carroll minutes you know hey. but it's like so Relax. it's like look <laughs> so, and th i think too it's like christian coloco was like we, i think he was supposed to be a defensive yeah. anchor, oh absolutely right? yeah so losing right. him was a big yeah. big thing so. and that you and that's like unforeseen like yeah. how, how are you supposed to you know, I mean, yeah. like it's, it's a medical condition. And even he turns into Jante Porter, who, great game last night, but another offense first guy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Jante could guard a little ja bit. Jante impresses me in yeah. a lot of ways, but compared yeah. to Coloco, he's just not. Yeah, for sure. He's he doesn't project to be yeah. that kind of defense. He blocks shots, but he's not a rim protector yeah. in that same way, which is a weird kind of distinction. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's not to say that it can't be effective. I thought Jante was very effective yeah. defensively last night, but, um, yeah, it, it is kind of weird because, to your point, the starting lineup as is right now with four of the five pretty much penciled in um, with Jakob, with Scotty, with RJ, with Quickly. I think for, for RJ and Quickly, they can take some more ownership of improving that on their fronts as well, right? Like, it, it, it's, it changes IQ's uh, whole entire game if he goes from being a guy who the Raptors have to hide with their matchups versus being a guy who can hold his own. I'm not expecting him to, like, hold his own, and then be a great help defender elsewhere as well. Maybe he can do that as well. But for me, he needs to get to that step where he can really guard his own. Um, and then with RJ, I'm curious to see, what do you guys think about RJ defensively? Because to me, I feel like it doesn't seem like there's anything physically that he can't do to guard at least his own position. But sometimes you do see the lapses because how much those two guys improve defensively will dictate how much that fifth starter will need to do defensively and who that kind of player is. So... Do you see more growth in IQ and RJ and how they guard? I, I do. I think for me, RJ a lot of times just lapses. It's like he's not paying attention. Um, and in New York, like he was considered one of their best defenders, even though he probably shouldn't have been, right? I mean, there was a when they played the Heat, he did a considerable amount yeah. of time guarding Jimmy. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you're asking him to be like, you have Scotty guarding Jacob guarding the anchor, you have asking him to be like guarding the, the third best player on the roster. Or, mm -hmm lineups i think he could do it and he's still young it's just i think he he has the tools that's we look at it he has the tools for it it's just can he get in can he just like walk into the scouting report mm. um and pay attention to that and same thing I, with iq i think for him it's like i think he's an above average defender when he tries you know but it's like at this point in the season it's like very hard to evaluate guys and be like can this guy defend because this season is wash at this point right <laughs> so it's yeah, like yeah. i'm not every when they're losing games what do you want I'm me like, to do man the show's two hours yeah. man <laughs> but like we, i'm not gonna say something so when rj gets beat in a pick and roll or like yeah. gets beat by zion i'm not like hanging my head like this guy can't defend you know because i'm like this, yeah, this sure. season is done yeah no I, I agree like both of them have room to grow both of them right now are, are probably at least average defenders in the nba but to me, what I was really talking about earlier and what I think any good defense needs is someone who you can throw at a Luka Doncic, a Kawhi Leonard, and make them a bit uncomfortable. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and RJ, as toolsy as he is, I don't think he's ever going to develop into that guy. Right. And quickly, just because of his size, is always going to be a mismatch to, to those type of players. And again, you can't have three guys in your starting lineup mm. who are who Luka Doncic will look at in the eye and say... This is no problem. Like we I mean, watched, first off, Luka Doncic looks at ninety nine percent of the league. It says, but no we problem. watched that game together, the Dallas game, mm -hmm. and he 
looked at the Raptors and made a game within a game of that. Like he yeah. was just playing yeah. with yeah. himself, throwing the craziest passes. He was oh, that one where he, The one where he drove middle and then threw the over the shoulder right. oh, pass into the court. To but he, he was completely unbothered. And we've yeah. seen OG and Anobi on Luka Doncic, yeah, yeah. and and he doesn't play that way. Right. Well, and was, and so we need that kind of player. So. We we did see the rap Darko solution for a lot of this was like, all right, Scotty will do it. And Scotty was the answer of like, okay, well, we don't have something. Scotty will do it. You know what yeah. I mean? And I just think it, it it will tire him out just a little bit too much. Like, you know what I mean? If you really want him to take that next step and carry so much for you offensively as well, then it's difficult. Plus, it's one thing. It's like, okay, you know what? Scotty's going to guard on ball, but someone else is going to be able to help and make up for his help defense. You also need his help defense. Mm -hmm. I used to ask the man to guard on ball I'd rather and, him and off ball. Help. I'd rather yeah. him playing help. Exactly. So that's where you need a 3 and D type to, to come in and... Yeah. Who knows? I mean, um, you know, it, it will be difficult to find those guys. I'm sure the whole league is looking for those guys. Is there anybody in the roster that could kind of conceivably slide into that those slots right now? I or think is it's it just a hard no for you. I guys? think it's Ochai. Like, I, okay. I think he has real problems offensively and defensively. He he's he's just okay right now. But mm. I think when you look at his potential. And the way that they're playing him right now, he gets the, the number one matchup every night. I think they're trying to develop him into that kind of guy. He's a little bit different of a defender. He's smaller. He's more better at the at a point of attack on guards rather than these mm -hmm. big wings. But if I'm looking at the roster, Ochai is the only one I see as a, okay, maybe two years from now, this guy could be a pretty good 3 and D guy. Yeah, right. and the first first time when I saw him, I'm like, you remind me of OG, just like the jackness, you know? Yeah, so, right. Yeah. He, smaller legs, but smaller yeah. Smaller legs, yeah. I mean... Yeah, everyone. <laughs> OG got the Meg the Stallion. Love but I, I, I miss the I miss the days when like Donovan Mitchell would come to Toronto and it's like yeah. when OG was taking care of that. He's yeah. coming here and he's dropping. Think about the old days. The old days. <laughs> well, yeah. the thing with OG is he walked into the league like yeah. ready to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. It's like it's hard for me to see like guys developing mm -hmm. in that direction. It's not to say guys can't improve or on the margins, get more attuned. You you play the league more and more. You understand your matchups better. But like, yeah, I mean. They're giving Ochai that chance right now. And I think that it, it doesn't even matter as much to me. The fact that, like, last night he went 0 for 3, that's not as important as, as what you can do defensively. But the Raptors do need to find that. I mean, you're even seeing, like, they're going to McDaniels in some of these games to do that. Yeah. I had a question that I put in here <laughs> to set you guys up. <clears throat> you're, 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 I abstain. Your you're least favorite thing about Jalen McDaniels. I abstain. Hey. Um, How could you abstain, bro? Honestly, you're a guest. <laughs> never interacted with him. So okay. I can't. Probably an amazing person. I'm not, right? I'm, I'm, I don't. I don't know if we need to do all that. I just meant like on the court. Like on the court, yeah. I think it's the tunnel vision. It's the tunnel of, vision. It's kind of like sort of insane to me. Yeah, like um, why? Like it's just like <laughs> you watch him. I'm like, I don't know what you know. That one guy on the roster when he gets the ball for the first time, you just yeah. don't know what he's gonna do with it. Yeah, and like you're, you're 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 like, will he give it back to me? Like he's that type of guy. Who's like he gets the ball for the first time. And it's yeah. Like, he did, this might be his last time touching the basketball, so he's about to do something crazy with it, you know. And and I don't blame him. It's like you gotta, hey, you gotta eat. You gotta take those opportunities. But he's got a guaranteed contract for next year. What do you mean you gotta eat? Hey, but sometimes the food I, is coming. But I'll be honest. Sometimes I look at his contract and I'm like, hey, man, Delano's making half of that, and he's what he's doing in Portland. I'm like, yeah. hey, well, you could explain why Delano's not here. Hey. Yeah, like I'll 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 say because I don't want to take the easy route out. Like him and and Bruce Brown. To me, have the same problem. I'll, I'll group them in, and it's easier mm. to to hate that way. <laughs> is like this man said, it's easier to hate when it's it's two for one two. combo. No, but the, hey, both of those guys, <laughs> both of those guys make selfish decisions with the ball. Yeah, and to be quite frank, they're not good enough to. Yeah. Like they're not Scotty Barnes, and you're especially when you have these injuries and new guys coming in. Like you need to keep moving the ball. You need to keep trusting your teammates and. Both of those guys just make bad decisions. Mm. It's one too many dribbles in the paint with five hands reaching in and, and a turnover mm. when it could have just been a pass. And um, that's why Ochai, to me, is like, for all his faults, he at least knows he, himself. he knows his role exactly. Yeah. He's like, ah, this one's not for me. And I'm fine with that, man. Yeah. Like, when you have Kelly Olynyk on the floor, IQ on the floor, like, give them the ball. Yeah. Let right. them make the decision. Yeah, well, I mean, I, that's the thing. It's not easy to find these type of players. The Raptors did try to cycle through a lot of them, you know, and he, he, ironically, we are now short that one six nine type of, like, small forward that can really come in and do it. But, I mean, historically, when you look at it, like you mentioned earlier, like, the Raptors have tried to address this issue in the past, and that's why they had felt so secure for so long 
with like OG finally getting drafted and taking that spot and be solid for like six, seven years with it. In between, they had Kawhi as well. So these are the hardest spots to really fill, you know? So um, that's that's tough. Pivoting off the Raptors, I guess. So defensively, yeah, they've, they've, they they got to figure it out. You know, I think um, they can change the personnel to accommodate certain areas, but ultimately the personnel is what it is. And I think that that is interesting, by the way. If, if you can't get better defensively around the other four, then it's going to be harder for Grady to enter that starting five. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people really want to just push him mm -hmm. and, and advance him in that way. Um, speaking of a former Raptor that, that struggled with defense, all right, this is this is a this is a, this is one I'm throwing out of the left field for you. But we're having the discussion of planning for the show. Did you guys watch the Marta Rosen last night? The the Bulls versus the Pacers. Just just the end and overtime. Yeah. That's all you need to see, honestly. <laughs> yeah. The NBA puts together these really nice videos of like wild finishes, and it's just like mm -hmm. the, the most important parts. The NBA even knows they're like, yo, you only need to watch the last five minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why we cut. That's why we clipped this for you, yeah. <laughs> for the put on YouTube. But you gotta watch that because Demar had an amazing game, forty six points, but he also had like a fall away on the baseline to, to force overtime in the first place. Pascal had an insane block yeah, on Kobe White. Hopefully Kobe White's okay because he also fell on Kobe White, but it was a great block, super clean, just a tough landing. Um, but DeMar DeRozan ends up finishing and winning that game for them, for, finishing with 46 points. We were discussing this game on uh, upstairs, and the question was posed to us by producer Mark Boffo, shouts to him, is DeMar DeRozan a future Hall of Famer for you? Right now, just 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 a quick yes or no from Oren and Liban here. Yes, because... USA stuff too. Okay. He has a gold medal. I'm um, biased. He's, he's like, I grew I told people in his first year mm -hmm. as a rookie, I think he's going to be an all star. So you told people his first year as a rookie is going to be all star? I bet, I bet people. Lee Van was I four still, years old. And, Yo, that's crazy. And I still, they still owe me money. Uh -huh. I bet people that he's going to be all star. Say their names. Hey, I don't, I don't want to call them out. Okay, but yeah. hey, they still haven't paid me back. But yes, for well, me. Will 100%. you take a Bellissimo's gift card? I will. Okay. It was only like $10 that we bet, but yeah. that's two meals. <laughs> At Bellissimo's. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, good. I'm happy you guys both said yes, because to me, I was like, I got to think about it a little bit. Not not to be a hater. I just got to think about it a little bit. But then I, I looked up the NBA's, like, all-time scoring, like, list of, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. He's 32nd in all-time scoring. He, he just passed Larry Bird mm -hmm. in, in yeah, NBA yeah. scoring. I think he's, like, 3K from, like, Kevin Garnett. It was like, he's, like, 20th or something like that. It's good that you mentioned that, because... Um, uh, on this list, he's 32nd. So there's 31 guys above him on the NBA scoring list. Um, everybody is already in the Hall of Fame who's above him. The guys who aren't are guys who will become in the Hall of Fame. Like LeBron, KD, Carmelo, Vince Carter, James Harden, Russell Westbrook, Stephen Curry. I think we can all agree those guys are all yeah. going to the Hall of Fame, right? Um, DeMar is still only 34. One of the healthiest players in the league, right? He, just, he might miss like five, six games in a season, but that's that's been the consistency in his game. Keeps himself in great shape, all that kind of stuff. At two more seasons, so basically scoring about 1,800 points a, a, a year so far. If he does this for two more seasons, DeMar would be at essentially 27,000 points, and he would be like 14 above like Oscar and like Dominique in all-time scoring. If he does this for three more years, he would be midway through his – he'd be at 28,580 points roughly. It will put him in the top 10 just above Carmelo. If DeMar did it for three more years. And again, I don't, like, I, it's it's kind of unbelievable to me because I think if you look back at it, did we have two Hall of Famers on the Raptors roster? Because we, I think we would all have Kyle as a Hall of Famer as well. It helps us his case that he's got the ring as well. But yeah. to me, you don't need the ring, though, because, yeah. like, no offense to the Basketball Hall of Fame, but anybody walks into that that's, nowadays, right? That's, that's what, what I was going to say. That's, that's what I was okay, going to say. Like, right. the, the Hall of Fame is too easy to get into, so oh, these right. guys deserve it with what yeah. the current criteria is, but if I were to make a Hall of Fame, I think the criteria would be a little, you know, more yeah. tight. And, and he owns, like, so many Raptors records. Like you he does, yep. yeah. He's the top of everything. Won at the Olympics, won gold I think, with the World Cup. Like, yep. he's won a lot. I know, like, we nitpick and be like, is he? Can he perform in the playoffs? Mm -hmm. Like the basketball hall of fame is not asking you that. <laughs> They're asking you for a playoff riser. Yeah, that's six fair. time All Star. Right. Like, yeah, so I just, I easy. guess, I just didn't fully appreciate the fact that Demar could conceivably, like, not even ridiculous, that he could finish his career as a top ten all time scorer. That's like, pretty total, wild. Total points. But we do have to also take into account all the scoring stuff you mentioned earlier with the league he came, he he is in right now is just mm -hmm. like in this 
golden age of scoring. But here's the thing, though. DeMar's been doing this with ones and twos. It's not like he mm-hmm. spammed threes. That's anymore. a good point. Mm-hmm. That's DeMar's a good point. classic ones and twos type of player. <laughs> ones and twos guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the pace matters. Like, it does the matter the, okay, the, yeah. the, the way the game has changed. But it's a good point. Like, yeah. he does not rely on the three the same extent as a lot of these guys in today's game. Yeah. Shouts to DeMar DeRozan. I'm just happy for him. Um, I guess I was happy for Pascal with that block too. Again, if you haven't seen it, that was a that was an incredible block. But you know, the, I don't know. There's something about Demar right now where he's like so undeniable in the clutch. This, especially recently, and the Bulls are becoming more competitive. Yeah. I mean, I, I was also watching that game, and Loki, I was like, damn, how many of these uh, losses have Pascal had against Demar? Because <laughs> there's a lot of times where like Pascal does things to like put himself and usually the Raptors in the past, and now the Pacers now. Like, put him in position to beat DeMar, and then DeMar would just, you know, do his thing in the fourth quarter. We've seen him in Toronto quite a yes. bit, mm-hmm. even against Toronto. But um, shouts to DeMar DeRozan. I guess the Raptors defense is bad. It's time to talk kind of basketball. Thank We're going to take that break. Been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptors Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptors Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, William Luke. Sorry, there's a uh, – Derek has played some – it's rage against the machine, he tells me. Yeah. So I was trying to do my best screamo. You guys have heard me do karaoke. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're I, crazy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's my hidden talent. I have videos. You know what? I have you videos don't... about you, too. So let's, <laughs> no, let's not okay, release okay, them, okay? okay we we got, we're mutually hey. assured destruction here. Yeah. Me, Lee Ban, Orin, you know. This is, does this feel more like the karaoke booth? Or does this feel more like the 590 booth that we typically sit at in the games? Like, what's the vibe that we're going for today? More of a game game booth vibe, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Less tame though. Less the game booths are crazy. Yeah, they're they're high energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you. Okay, Everyone else on. is chilling and you're <laughs> you've lost your vibe. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty chill, I find, until like the fourth quarter. Yeah. <laughs> now give people give people the behind the scenes. What 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 is it like in the five ninety booth, guys? Hey man, a lot of I wouldn't say name calling, but <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that that's outrageous. Not name calling, but um yeah, and, and, but what happens in the booth stays in the booth, you know? So Exactly. That, that's except, the except the, like, Raptors executive booth is, like, right next two feet away. <laughs> and they definitely hear, like, yeah. half of the stuff. But uh, mostly, like, yelling at the refs yeah. from, like, very yeah. far yeah. is yeah. the biggest thing I would And the say. amount of times I've, right. like, like closed the door just in case, mm. like, they're hearing that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd rather not. <laughs> for, your, for your sake. There's a lot of poutine being eaten in there. Yeah, of um, course. There's a lot of Chinese food usually. Yeah, yeah. shouts to Shanghai 360. You know, still waiting on that season-long sponsorship. Damn, you haven't got it yet? Nah. I don't hey. think they got it like that. No offense. I'm Damn. in there just fasting, just like... Yeah. Do you bring your own lunch to the Raptor God. games? No, yeah. I don't. Bro, I've seen you dinner. Do this. It's Yo. dinner, and I've done it like twice. Yeah, I ate Bro, a pork chop was in like, my hand. This guy, was, this guy had a pork chop bigger <laughs> than his head at the game, I Yo, swear. Yo, yesterday I, I had swear. the worst public shawarma eating experience of my life <laughs> oh, it went yeah. all over my shoes it was terrible Goodness. but anyways what happened man no nah, we don't even get into it <laughs> <laughs> i told you like it was just <laughs> the wettest shawarma and, oh, and i it ate it on, i ate it on a, a park bench because it was beautiful outside uh-huh, yeah. but I, I looked down and i realized it had just dripped all over these white nikes i got and, oh, my, wow. and my pants and i had to go to an interview after that i was interviewing someone for the book <laughs> By the way, I'm writing a book about Canada <laughs> basketball and the growth of Canadian about, basketball, golden it. generation. I got to plug it when I'm on the show. Yeah, uh, 2025. Follow me on Twitter for it, updates. Man. You know, we're going to get gonna you. Be we're going to talk about you all the time about that book. No, it's going to be great. So yeah. just had to plug that. But yeah, for sure. Build a lot of shawarma for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the shawarma should not be wet, okay? It should not. <laughs> it was a saucy, sauced up shawarma. Yeah, apparently. Because I, I was in Etobicoke and I read at best shawarma in town. I was like, I oh, gotta try. Where'd you try go? It. You went to Kebab Club? House or something. Yeah, mm, Kebab House. Nice. Yeah. You know why restaurants aren't named like that? Yeah. <laughs> nah, it was. They don't put it in the. It was title. actually pretty good. Yeah. No, seriously, that's it's always a beef I've had. Um. Okay. Putting aside that, um, you, you know, you're writing that book about Canada basketball, and this is taking up most of your time, right? For um, sure. Wanted to talk about Canada basketball a little bit. Pivot, you know, to another subject. Thank goodness. Um, we, we do get to see um, both Jordy Fernandez come to town next week with the Sacramento Kings. He's been an assistant there. He's the head coach of the men's team. And uh, we will see Shea next Friday. I know that's a game that we will not be missing. Of course not. Yeah. And Lou. Shout out to Lou And, and Lou Dort. You're right. Right? Shout out to Lou Dort as well. And it got me thinking a little bit just like, okay, I'm obviously watching this Raptors for this season, but I'm also watching for a second team. You know what I mean? How's Canada going to do? 
And we saw Jamal. We saw what he did to the Raptors in that fourth quarter. We saw what he did to Kelly in that fourth quarter, that yeah. one where Kelly got him stuck, and he's like, nah, step through, finger roll with my left, and it still went in. Um, it got me really excited thinking about what the top eight for Canada's roster could be, mm-hmm. best case scenario, going into the Olympics. Um, so I would love to hear from both of you, maybe Lee Van, you go first, on who your top eight is right now uh, for the Olympics. Yeah, let's start off with eight. Um, I'm, I'm more struggling with the, the seven, eight. Kind okay. Of, actually, maybe not seven, eight. I don't think I'm really struggling with it. Just, I'm going okay. with uh, what I think will be the core. Right. And it's basically the same guys that were there last year. Okay, so um, give, me the, give, me the, give me the list. And I'm just adding one. Um, hopefully, so it's going to be Shea, mm. obviously. Mm. Jamal, if he's healthy. That's your added one. Yeah, that's my added one. Okay. Dylan Brooks, mm. Lou Dort, mm-hmm. RJ Barrett, yep. the White Powell, yep. Kelly Olynyk, yep. and Nikhil Alexander-Walker. That's mm. your six. I had the same eight. Same eight. So, there's no Andrew Wiggins on either of your list. No. No, you asked, I mean, you asked, like, who who are the best eight this season? Andrew Wiggins has not been better than Nikhil Alexander or Lou Dort this season. Mm. Like, yeah. straight up for me. Yeah. Okay. And, um, yeah, I don't know if you want to get into, like, who you would start. That's the thing, too. It's like, cause... for me, when it comes to Wiggins, it's like, will you accept a bench role? Yeah. Coming to play? That's interesting. Because because a year ago or two, a year or two ago, I don't think we were having this discussion saying no, Wiggins like, hey, will come off come, the bench. You, you want to play? But you're, after you're, what you're, they you're did, starting. right? After yeah. what they did at the World Cup, yeah. will you let mm. Dylan Brooks start? Will you? And I think... Bro, there's no way I'm benching Dylan Brooks. Exactly. No way. And RJ Barrett, did. I don't want to see him off the bench. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you could go back and forth with him, but I think you go... To me, it's actually... If Jamal's playing, I think you go Shea, Jamal, when, you, when we're talking starters. That's your backcourt. I think Lou Dort... Um, the White Powell, Kelly Olynyk, but to me, Kelly Olynyk's like you can like what they did in the World Cup. He yeah, was yeah. like in and out. It's like yeah, defensive yeah, right. concerns, right? So, um, yeah, and I think Lou Dort or Dylan Brooks can play the four or five, mm. not the four or five, but like yeah. the White Powell would be the five, yeah, but the four. Yeah. So real quick on Andrew Wiggins, I'll I'll just say this: like they Canada basketball asked for this three year commitment. Andrew Wiggins wasn't willing to do it. The mm-hmm. only way I think he was going to make this summer's team. Is if he was one of the best players in the league this mm-hmm. season, and so it's he's like undeniable. Just, you can't, you can't not have him. Exactly, kind of yeah. and the fact that he's dropped off so hard, mm-hmm. plus the fact that he hasn't been around the last two summers, to me, I just don't see it happening. Like Jamal Murray, not only is he leveling up, yeah. I think he's really one of the best guards in the league. He's been there last two summers. He's been in those training yeah. camps. He's he knows the system. He knows Jordy. Mm-hmm. He knows the guys. Mm-hmm. Andrew hasn't been there, so that's like a big difference on top of the, their play. Yeah. In terms of starters, I went um, Shea, Jamal, RJ, Dylan, and Dwight. Mm. Just like you said, Kelly came off the bench a little bit mm-hmm. just because defensive matchup. You do both, need more defense. Both him yeah. and Kel- and Dwight need a guard fives. So I think those were some of the problems you saw in that Spain game when, when Kelly started coming off the bench for uh, Lou. So yeah, like obviously you're small and your rebounding hurts when, when uh, you put Brooks at the four. But I think you put the most talent out there. You put your five best guys out there, and that's who they are, in my opinion. Mm. And then you shuffle in the second halves and stuff, matchup dependent. If you need to get bigger, get Kelly in there, mm-hmm. et cetera. Because I think that's that's the one thing where it's like, okay, Andrew's not playing well, but he plays. Uh, he gives a premium like skill set, a need that right. like bigger. Obviously, he's super athletic. Um, we've seen him rebound at a very high level in certain moments yeah. in the finals, for example. But um, as you mentioned, man, it's, the season's not been good, so yeah. I, I get it either way. Uh, no, no, Nemhard in your either rotations. He's he's there to me. He's like is there um, a conversation? He's Nemhard? added. He's like my nine ten. Like that. Okay. He's he's in that mix. Yeah. And I think Canada should really consider him. He wants to play, and he's willing to accept whatever role. He's that type of player, right? Mm. So, okay. um, imagine to me, I'd love to see like a off the bench him in the keel. That'd right. Be a fun combo, I think. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. He was right on the bubble for me. I think it'd be great to have him. He said he wanted to play. And, like, you think about Shea and Jamal, both those guys could go on long playoff runs. Olympics in July, it's not the same break we had for the World Cup. So those exhibition games and stuff, like, you want another point guard there. For sure. You you want another good point guard there. Whether, you know, I hope there's no injuries, but even just to keep those guys fresh for the games that matter, you really want a guy like Andrew Nemhard there. But yeah, I think he's the ninth man. And I also think guys like Chris Boucher, Trey Lyles, Tristan Thompson, I think they're also on the bubble in terms of giving you that skill set. Right. Big guys, rebounders, three-point shooters. 
that you can use. Those are also not core guys, but guys I would consider bringing in. I was going to say, too, is, like, my big concern will likely be, and I think everyone's probably, like, is wondering, will Jamal like actually be there? Yeah, because absolutely. say they do make a long playoff run again, they get to the finals. Mm-hmm. NBA final starts, I think, June 6th, I believe. And camp is supposed to start, say that series goes to two weeks or whatever it is. I think the is. earliest camp could start is, like, June 27th. Exactly. Like so he's going to get, what, a week or two off? right before and he didn't he wasn't able to play the past summer and he had like a whole month off right mm-hmm. so it's like are, are you like i personally if i'm jamal i'm going for the championship right to me it's like yeah. that that olympic st- stuff's gonna come but if you're healthy but enough bro, is it gonna to come it. because we've seen that like you can't take this thing for granted like you it's can. literally yeah. been 24 years since canada was the men's side was in the olympics yeah so there's no guarantee and he's in the prime of his career it's like you, you kind of, I mean, it's unfortunate because I also do think that the Nuggets will repeat and I think that Jamal is going to play a huge part and he's going to be super banged up and, and you know, giving everything. Yeah. But <laughs> it's right there, yeah. you know? It'll be tough. Just depends how his body is, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Damn. And it depends on what guys value. Like, I don't I don't want to, again, going to plug my book, and I don't want to yeah, get into ahead. Jamal's head, but, like, you, when you, you look at the history the show, of the man. program... Just, just, yo, I wish I had prehistoric you, work sitting yeah, like, properly on you, set, you look at the history of the men's program, and, yeah, like, guys are always injured. This has always been, like, a huge problem with NBA guys, but the guys who play are the guys who value that more than they value rest, mm-hmm. and it's more they value it more than they value even, like, having a good start to their next NBA season. The guys who play are the ones who, like, really want to be there for their country and really understand the importance of an Olympic Games and, and what it means to represent Canada there. So, like, I don't know if Jamal is going to be injured or, or or if he's going to be healthy at that time. And and he'll have so many different things to weigh. It's mm. it's really hard. But, what, but again, it's really, like, what do you want to prioritize? Is, mm. is, is this Canada thing so meaningful to you that you're willing to go into it banged up and all that stuff mm. and even enter the next NBA season – a little less fresh than you would otherwise, we'll see. And that's just not just like a Jamal thing. That goes for so many of these guys. And, mm. and um, that that's something that when you look at the Serbias, the Germanys of the world... It's not they, even a question. They have yeah. a culture, yeah. exactly. It's mm-hmm. not a question. You just do it. Like Spain. Like, mm-hmm. Pau Gasol was playing for them like late 30s. Like, right. yeah, I'm there. I got yeah. you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, so Canada needs to get to that point, and uh, but I think we're close. That's the thing. I think, close, I think yeah. we're getting we're getting so much closer to that because the, you you got these quotes from Dylan Brooks, and this came out I think last week. And Dylan Brooks said, "quote When you come and play for your country, it's all about the pride. It's not about the money. It's not about anything else except pride and representing your country." And, and he's talking about these other players that potentially could join them that weren't with them in the World Cup. He said, "quote They played with Team Canada before, and we need to get better." And he went on to say um that quote i said this after we won the bronze and it doesn't matter we got to re-up we got to get better so add jamal add nem hard add wiggins that's gonna make our team better those guys are selfless players that gets you excited man no but i i can imagine dylan brooks having these conversations directly one-on-one with guys too you know i think i think that happens when dwight powell was in town i was asking him and he was like a lot of the times like when he sees guys on the road yeah visiting nba teams when he sees the canadians he's like you come in the summer, like yeah. what's he's asking them that, like good. That's which that's is culture. Yeah, that's, that's culture. culture. Yeah. That's why he's a team, one of the team captains, team captains, right? So, right. um, it's cool though. It's like the fact that those guys are just texting each other, being like, "You play, you play this, like you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying." Like it's yeah. like I get goosebumps when I think about that, and like mm-hmm. what the team could look like this summer. For sure, for sure. Um, I think the other underrated part of this is that after Kelly got his extension, the entire seven man at least NBA roster rotation, because there's only seven NBA players and the rest of them were other players who just weren't in the league at the current moment. I don't want to be rude to them. They're, they're also made a big contribution as well. Mm-hmm. But those seven NBA players who played at the World Cup um, for Canada, all seven of them, after Kelly got his extension, have guaranteed contracts for this upcoming season. So it's not like any of them walking into free agency right now. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I think that that definitely certainly would help. Yeah, Definitely helps. Um, and not only that, just like to add to that, you look at that eight-man group we just mentioned. Other than Dwight Powell, they're all having arguably career years. Mm. Like, these guys are really playing well, and, and that's right. something There's not matters. a single guy in that group that's not contributing. Like, Lou Dort is having an incredible offensive season. This yeah, guy he really was, fixed his shot. He like. fixed his shot. He's one of the most dependable clutch time guys. He makes right decisions. Um, I don't know analytics. Nikhil Alexander-Walker... <laughs> 
is playing a huge role now that yeah. uh, he's starting a lot of games, now that Carl Anthony Towns is down. Like, he's really thriving. And Kelly Olynyk, we see, like, man, Kelly Ooh. has has Kelly ever been better offensively? Like, really, this guy is incredible. Yeah, the only he's thing he wasn't really doing was hitting threes at a high clip, and then he's starting to hit threes again. But also, so. like, we talk about warm-ups. Yeah. That guy does not miss in warm-ups. Oh, yeah. When I watch him, and he's shooting, like, 40-something percent from three. Like, he doesn't take a lot. That's the thing. I, yeah, I yeah. want him to take more. Yeah. Is the big thing, too, right? Yeah, but, you know, he doesn't need to spam threes because a lot of the offense is... Somebody else is. It's actually a little bit similar to, you know, just international basketball in general, where you see the bigs used a lot as yeah. a high post. Like, mm -hmm. that, that just happens way more. It's, like, super common in international basketball versus, like, in the league, it's become more and more popular. And honestly, because of the, the talent, right? Because Jokic has come in and done it. Because yeah. Embiid's come in and done it. Because Sabonis has come in and done it. You know what I mean? So Talking about those guys, that's my biggest concern with those yeah. guys in basketball. Right. Who will guard Embiid? Who will guard Jokic? Who will guard Rudy Stop Gobert? It. Embiid's not playing. Stop you don't this think he's right playing? Now. No way. You don't, he, hey, why would he even register or like sign up for... Bro, he did the whole thing. He can't stay healthy, though. Yo, like, how did he oh, do... okay, my, my fault. Yeah, I'm, yeah, that's yeah, what he's, I mean. He's definitely like, not blessed with 100%. He's just he really did the my though. decision. You know? I, I completely <laughs> my, forgot like he's next injured. next chapter, and it was with nationality. <laughs> that was wild. I completely Crazy. forgot that he's injured, but Rudy Gobert, I'm not really worried about, but, like, uh -huh. Jonas Valanciunas, those guys. Yeah. That's a bonus, you know? I it's like... You could put him in pick and roll, you know what I mean? Like, you can. Try, try to, like, run them yeah. off the floor a little bit, play small. But that, that, but I hear you, though. It's yeah. a concession. Like, it really is. Yeah. Is there nobody coming up? Like, what about my, what about my half-Chinese brother, uh, Zach Eady? Hey. He's, that's the thing, though. He's going to be... The draft is, what? I think the 27th, 26th, 27th, mm -hmm. around that time. Mm -hmm. Like, it's... I would say very unlikely, unless he has something already predetermined that he's going to be playing. But I think go, going into your... Uh, being drafted, it's impossible for you to play Right. Yeah, summer. yeah, he'll be an interesting one. It's basically one. never happened, right? Yeah. I, don't think I think it's happened because USA used to have guys that would, like, play in college, like... And they go, sure. right? Okay. And they, 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 like, I think Anthony Davis was a case. I, I'm not too sure. Oh, yeah, right yeah, after. yeah, right, right. But, like, they'd get yeah. college guys, right? Um, okay. So it has to be something maybe in place. But AD was there. number one pick. This is, this yeah. is it's, a, exactly. it's a guarantee. You yeah. don't have no guarantee if you're wherever exactly. Zach Eadie's going to get drafted. Exactly. We don't know. That's the thing, right? That's just saying. Okay, you scratched yeah. it off the table. I guess you said Tristan Thompson earlier. Like... Is, yeah. he, is he not banned? Because But that's the thing. Olympics are so serious with that kind of stuff, no? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. I, I don't know. I don't know if he'll be eligible to play. I know he wants to. Zach Eady, we did talk to him when he was in Toronto with uh, that Alabama game, and he said he w was planning on playing. I, I think it's possible in terms of, like, if he's a first-round pick and he has a guaranteed contract, he could probably make it happen. But even then... I don't know if they take him on that 12-man roster. Like, we Whoa. saw he had real struggles in the World Cup. Yeah. But, like, of course, what you guys are saying, like, the big man position is really where they're weak. Mm. Chris Boucher is interesting to me. But he's never really even been, like, has he not been yeah. invited to these? Like, what's, I don't, what's I don't the deal? See that happening. Has he not been invited or he just hasn't gone? Like, he's been is... invited. He's expressed okay. interest whenever, like, I've talked to him or, like, I think any other reporter oh, so he's expressed he's, interest. So he's, 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 he's gotten the invite and he's expressed interest. Then why hasn't he done it? Chris had obviously no con no contract certainty until two years ago sure, when he got yeah. that long term deal, and then the last two summers he basically told me he was dealing with personal stuff and okay. and he just didn't have time okay, for the okay, national team. Fair. Said he wanted to play this year, but yeah, we'll see. And 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 yeah, that, that's the thing. Even him, even Tristan, those guys come with their flaws, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and there there is no perfect solution to guarding a Nikola Jokic yeah. uh, on the team, or really even I don't think coming down the pipeline. Yeah, I, I, that's I the one tough thing. Yeah. Like you just wish there was one like really, really solid. Doesn't even have to be exceptional. You know what I mean, like, man, Ken Birchfield. I'm about to say Ken Birchfield. <laughs> what you doing up there, you? Representing we the North. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I, I, I've said it on the show, and I'll say it again. Like Dwight Powell gets so underrated in these discussions. Okay, yeah, He's fair. by yeah. far our best option in as a post defender, okay. as a pick and roll mm -hmm. defender, and and I think he gets overlooked a lot, and I think yeah. he will be the starting center and. Yeah, that's not going to be where the strength of the team is. But if you have Jamal yeah. and Shea in the no, backcourt, exactly. yeah. you can you can play in those games. I just wish I, I saw more from like Paul this season because he's fall, falling out of the rotation yeah. with Dallas. Yeah, so I mean, Dallas also drafted a new center. Yeah, you know I mean, then they traded yeah, for another center. Yeah. So like he's, you know, it is what it is. But yeah. you know, I guess Kyle Alexander, Chance to Kyle Alexander, Alexander. Yeah. yeah, got some size, got some yeah. shot blocking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously we know the strength of the team is in the guards, and it's time now for the spicy take of the day. That's probably surprises on you guys. Brought to you by new Chunky Spicy Super. You ready to get fired up? Yeah, my spicy take is, honestly, it don't matter how much the bigs are because Canada is going to have the best backcourt at the Olympics if Jamal Murray comes through. It's going to be the best backcourt of the entire Olympics. Better than the U.S.? Here's the thing. U.S. Steph bring, Curry? I agree. U.S. bring old guys. <laughs> okay. Old. 
know what I mean? I agree. You know, they're, they're older. I mean, like, you, well, you can I'll stack resumes. Them. I'm not trying to disrespect Steph Curry or, like, Dame or whoever wants to come. But older, though. We talking about players in their prime right now? Canada's going to have the best one. Shea and Jamal, if Jamal comes through, that's going to be tough. I don't even know how they're going to share the ball, quite frankly, but it, it won't matter. It won't matter. It won't matter. It'll look good. That's my spicy take. Well, I think I, I agree. I don't think it's that spicy. I think it, okay. All right. they play off each other so well because Jamal is such a good off-ball player playing yeah. with Jokic. You could make an argument for the States because I'm just thinking now, if Steph and Booker play, people would probably take that backward, and I, I wouldn't blame them if they mm. did. Mm. But... Yeah, okay, all right. It's but competition if I was to for sure. They're number two. In it, There's yeah. no shame in being number two. Yeah. yeah. And if I was to poke holes in it, um, I would say Shea is the best defender of those four. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, Booker actually Booker really likes to cha- like the challenge, but yeah. I think Shea is more disruptive, gets more steals. Right. So just yeah. and then there's the experience factor as well. Mm. Canada has that. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. All right. Well good I, take. It, it was a take. It's I mean a good take. I, I forgot that uh until Ahmed told me it was like we haven't done it. And I was like, all right, I'll just I'm a one one on the spot, but okay. yeah, I mean, I, I'm just really like excited to watch that in the summertime um, because I think it's just a really good time for the program in general. You think Jordy's gonna get a chance to get become an NBA head coach soon? Be, will he be in the next round of interviews? Like, what do you think the ca- coaching Canada's experience is gonna do for him professionally, at least here? I think he's on the cusp. So um, that's I, that's been my concern. It's like, will that impact Canada basketball? I don't think it will. I mean, but. we had Michael Bartlett on about a month ago. Yeah. Um, Canada basketball CEO, and, and he was like, you know what? That's not going to affect it. Like, yeah. it's not going to be a situation like when Nick got hired in Philadelphia. It was like, ah, I might not have time for this. Sorry, I got to go. Yeah. Right. Um, that was assured. But, you know, you can always assure things, and maybe th- situations actually do change when it happens. But I choose to believe him, at least in that moment. But, I mean, you know, what do you guys make of him as a coach? Because I feel like the coolest thing with watching the the World Cup and the FIBA coverage and everything is like those cameras into the timeout huddles. And you got to like actually hear everything they're saying. The camera's right there. You can see what he's drawing up. And you can see the sort of level of engagement and the personality that he came with. And I, I was just really impressed. Like I was fired up watching at home at 3 a.m. blinking <laughs> because it was in Manila, all that kind of stuff. But what do you guys make of Jordy in general? Yeah, I was impressed with him too. I think sometimes it is hard to distill how hard are these guys playing for Jordy? And how hard are they playing because they're wearing Canada on their chest okay, okay, they're with okay. a bunch of friends All right. who they grew up with? Like, this means something more than the NBA does to a lot of these guys. So in that sense, it is a little hard to distill how much the head coach is doing. But like you said, he kept it simple. He mm-hmm. organized them really well. He asked Shay in that one huddle that we got some insight to, like, do you want do you want an ISO or do you want the ghost screen, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that was when D- Dylan's man came and ghost screened it. So I, Is that I when he dropped Mikel Bridges. No, that wasn't. It was in the Spain <laughs> game when he dropped the other guy, hit a yeah. step back two, and yeah. and iced the game. Um, so Jordy, he did everything he could to prove he was a good coach in that tournament, and that's why I looked at stuff like what happened with the Bucks, and it frustrates me because the same five head coaches get the same jobs over and over again in the NBA. Yeah, there's no creativity. Talk about it. Mm. And if you want to like be brave but still get a guy who has experience jordy is sitting right there yeah. he proved that he can be a head coach yeah and that he can be a good one and yet these these teams like the bucks are afraid to take a chance on a guy yeah. like that and they go to doc rivers who's a sure thing but not necessarily his upside maybe isn't isn't that yeah. high that's your chunky spicy soup take right there yeah is that spicy Let's that get Doc Jordy Rivers isn't that coach. great of a coach? Like, I actually think he's doing okay with the book so far. But in any case, we're going to run out of time for that discussion. Orin, real quickly, when's your book coming out? Fall of 2025, The Golden Generation. Follow me on Twitter at Orin Weisfeld for updates. Um, already interviewed a bunch of exciting people. Well, I said quick, man. Plug uh, is crazy. Right. I love it. All right. There it is. It. Yeah. Lee Van, appreciate you. He, he <laughs> ate all your shine, so I can't. <laughs> I can't catch it. Lee Van at a, a Bellissimo's near you. But hey. that does it for us today. I've been your host, Will. You've been listening to the Raptor Show on the Sports Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Time to get fired up. Big thanks to our guest today, Garrett Temple, Orrin Weissel, Lee Van Osmond. We will be back tomorrow. <laughs>